Have you ever wondered how the Lord coming down as a king in the form of a baby changes everything? That's what we'll talk about today. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me where thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. John Wesley, Covenant Prayer. Today we're going to continue our conversation and talk about Hidden Christmas, the surprising truth behind the birth of Christ by Timothy Keller. Last week, we talked about this book and how it started out talking about the meaning of the birth of Jesus. And we're going to continue that discussion today. It's interesting to the author and me too, where Jesus was born the king of the Jews, born the king of this world. When we think about kings, we don't have kings anymore like we used to. A lot of them are ceremonial. But at that time, the king was everything. Herod was the king at that time. Herod was a terrible human being. And he murdered much of his family. He did everything he could to stay in power. If he heard that there was a plot against him, he went out and overkilled people just to make sure the plot never happened. When you think of kings, he was absolutely among the worst. And if we remember the Christmas story, Herod goes and sends people, the three magi, to go find this child because a prophecy was that a child was going to be born. And this bright light, the star in the sky, was indicating something's out there happening and I want someone to go find it. I want someone who knows intellectually about prophecies, about what's supposed to happen, to go out there and look for it. They go out and sure enough, they find baby Jesus in the manger, as the prophet said, and the wonder that it was. But they had items on them of value, and they gave them to Jesus when they got there. They decided to go back a different way, and there's a fantastic song by James Taylor called Home by Another Way, where they basically said, hmm, well, Herod sent us out here to do these things. Let's go home by another way. (laughs) Just always love that idea. You know, we're just going to take a different road. As soon as Herod figures out that the Magi did not come back, did not inform him, he decided that he was going to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and the surrounding area who were two years and under. And so Joseph and Mary, they took off. They went to Egypt and lived there. The book was saying that at the time there was a very big expatriate community of Jewish people who did not appreciate the leadership, the kingdom of Herod's. So Joseph and Mary were probably among other people who were also trying to escape Herod's wrath. And Herod even lied about it. Oh, go find them because I want to go worship God too. I want to worship the Messiah. It was all a trick. He says that at the time, knowing about populations of towns, there probably would have been 20 to 30 children of that age. So this was shocking. What Herod ordered, the death of the children, it was tragic. It was a horrible thing. And Herod was a horrible human. Our history, we know from our time, that it was a horrible time. It was an evil time. And Herod was an evil person. When we take a look at him as a king, he says that we really have little Herods inside of all of us. We want to be the ruler of our lives, and we don't want anything to stop it. I was talking in the other podcast, Start With Small Steps, about how George Bailey had to decide whether he was going to get what he wants or he was going to give up and sacrifice for his community. In the end, we all want what we want. We don't want anyone to force us. We don't want anyone to tell us what to do. And Herod, in doing the things he did, was trying to basically destroy any possibility that anything was going to happen that he did not want to happen. But by saying that we have the Herods in us, we know that we have a real ability to decide in favor of what is best or what we think is best for us. He says that we want to be seen as a cooperative person, as a good neighbor, all those things. But that little Herod in there basically shows that we hate obligation We hate being told anything. We want God to be helpful to us. We want him to give us strength and love and peace. 
but we don't want to be told what to do. See that when we talked about that first episode, about what Adam and Eve thought about what God was offering them in the garden. Don't tell me what to do. By listening to the lies and hearing what they want to hear, just like when we listen to lies and hear what we want to hear, we will give up on what God wants for us because we don't want to be pushed around. He says that a lot of theologians say that people seek out God, but they don't actually want to find God who he really is. We want to find God who we want him to be. We want God to be a vending machine. We want God to be a soft shoulder to talk to, to listen to our woes in life, and then to fix them. But what we don't realize is that Jesus is not just someone else, our absolute king. He is the Lord of everything. He is in charge of everyone. And what we need to seek is the true Jesus. We think that Religion will help us put God, he says, in our debt, that we hope that if we say the right prayer, that if we give the right offering, if we do the right thing, then we will have God on our side and he will do for us the thing that we want him to do for us. But God is not a vending machine. He is the king of everything. And we may get what we want, and it may be because God gave it to us, but that is because it was God's will and God's love that did it not because we did something to make it happen. He does a quote from a person named Nagel who said, it's not just that he hopes that atheism is true. Quote, I know religious people. I know religious believers. It isn't just that I don't believe in God, naturally. I hope my belief is right. I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. And so it goes from us maybe hoping God is what we want him to be, hoping God fixes all the things that we want him to fix, but never asks us of anything, all the way to atheists who don't even want there to be a God. This was mind-melding to me. I think as an atheist, I wanted there to be a God. I certainly wanted someone that would come and put people in heaven, redeem us, give us the life that we were always meant to have. But I just didn't think there was one there. To say that I hope all of you just push up daisies and rot in the earth because I want to be right. But Timothy Keller says that nobody's neutral about Christmas. People have very strong feelings about whether this story is true and that the king of this universe was born in a manger in Bethlehem. He says that our Herods inside of us mean that we have to be a lot more intentional about our own Christian lives, about how we pray and how we're accountable to things. We just can't glide through this Christian life. We have to fight for it. We have to live for Christ because, quote, Christianity is not another vending supply spiritual services you engage as long as it meets your needs at a reasonable cost. Christian faith is not a negotiation, but a surrender. It means to take your hands off your life. It is a big deal to worship and love and follow the king of the universe. And that's where we have to go with direct battle with our own little Herods inside of us who want us to get what we want at all costs and not be asked anything for it, not be put to service at all. He says to remember that Jesus is going to be here twice. He came as the weakest member of humanity, a baby in a cradle in a pretty poor area of the world. And the next time he will come, it'll be the end of everything evil. He will come as the king. He will have power. It'll end all suffering and death. And this time will be the last time for evil to ever win. It's important to know, too, that it's really different, that Jesus is not the king we expect him to be. He didn't ask for power. He didn't want to sit on a throne. He didn't demand the downfall of all the other kings. When he was encountered with what should we do with our taxes, should we even pay Rome? What horrible people Rome was. Give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. He wasn't taking control. In all the stories in the Bible we see, There were people who wanted to do things their way. Abel killed Cain. Jacob tricked and stolen from Esau every chance he could, even though he was given the promises that he would be the ruler of a great nation. David 
should never have been king. It should have been his older brothers, if anyone at all. And the line of Jesus comes in through Leah, not Rachel. There's a funny story is that when um, I was raised Jewish, my Jewish name was Leah. And I always didn't like the name because Leah was what they called the cow-eyed sister of Rachel. Rachel was beautiful. Rachel was everything Jacob wanted. Leah was a hurdle to get to Rachel. And I thought, what a terrible person to be named from because she wasn't pretty. Cow-eyed probably means that she couldn't see very well. Maybe she had big, unruly eyes. I don't know. But it was in the end that Jesus came through the line of Leah and not Rachel. I also like the name Leah a lot more once I saw Princess Leah. So it was a whole other story. But you realize that Jesus as king isn't like Herod, where he's going to kill everybody who goes against him. Jesus is going to forgive. No matter what we did, no matter what awful thing is in our path, we are going to be saved by Jesus. And he loves saving us. He is happy when someone is returned, when that lamb, that lost lamb is brought back. He's been doing it through the entire mount of humanity, and he cares to bring back you too. He also demands of us that we're not snobs. You know, there's a lot of passages in the Bible about whether you're wealthy or poor, whether you're a man or a woman, whether you are a owner of land or not, you are to be loved as a brother, as a sister in Christ. And that we're not to be snobs, he says, or snobs about snobs, which means we can't go around being snooty about people who have money. Everyone has what they have, but our place is under Jesus the King. And once we get that, it makes us free from all of that. We no longer have to have envy. We no longer have to be angry about who we are. We are who God made us to be. And we are to use that in order to serve God's kingdom. So we shouldn't be afraid. We should take on everything that we can because God made us. So we go into some discussion in this book, which I really liked, about talking about why Mary was so incredible. I always thought Mary was pretty incredible, but when he talks about her, it's not about her being in the right place at the right time. It even mentions in the Bible that she was incredible. God picked her. But this is what he says about what Mary was like after this. Mary didn't have this sort of blind faith. She wasn't. It's great. I'm cool. This is cool. And then Timothy Keller says the text goes on to say, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. He says that the word wondered is not a great translation of that word. The word in Greek actually means to make an audit. So what Mary did is she was told something shocking. I mean, can you imagine this being a young girl, probably under 16 years old? By the way, you're going to be the mother of God's Messiah, the person we have been waiting for for thousands of years to come back. And you're going to be the mother. And I know that you're about to get married and your life is like this, but you know what? This is what's going to happen next. She thought about it to make an audit of it. So she was a thinker. She was troubled. That means she's a real human being. I'd be troubled too. She didn't go into this panic She didn't deny what was going on. She didn't laugh like Abraham and Sarah. She responded in a faith that was inside of her. She probably knew the scripture as good as anyone did. It was a story that was told from generation to generation. But she thought about it and she came back in faith. When we look at other places where people come with a reality from God and they look at things skeptically. They look at things with doubt, with anger. We see a lot of people who are angry with the church. I was just watching a panel of people who had been watching the show The Chosen, and their stories of faith and what faith meant to them, none of it good, had to do with anger and resentment. And it primarily had to do with the people around them 
that used faith to make them feel down. But the reality is that our faith in God does not have to do with what our parents said to us, or maybe how a pastor mistreated us, or how we think the church is this way or that way. This is about you and God, a direct connection between the two of them. And what Mary did is she accounted, she audited, she thought about it, and then she opened up in faith, able to face the truth of what was about to happen to her. And other people in the Bible, too, when confronted with God, all these reactions that you think about in the Bible itself, when Sarah was confronted with the prophecy that Isaac would be the father of a great nation, she got another woman to be with her husband. Not a good reaction. But what did Mary do? She grew in her faith and her commitment throughout her entire life. You see places in the Bible when Mary interacted with Jesus later on where she started to really understand who he was. Her faith grew. And instead of becoming bitter about the situation, laughing at the situation, not believing the situation, Mary accepts it. Mary says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Wow. So she wasn't loving it. Woohoo! This is awesome, he says. She wasn't lamenting it. She wasn't laughing at it. At times when God confronts us with something, it can have this opportunity to bring us closer or it can bring us apart. She chose the path that brought her closer. That's what makes Mary special. And a lot of times if we find out that God has something in planned for us, how many times are we fearful? Or how many times do we bargain with God? Okay, I'll move to this other place, but you have to provide a salary that's bigger than the salary I have now. Or you have to provide X, Y, and Z. We could bargain with him. We're not dealing with the king of the universe. Instead, it's where we have to be like Mary, rejoice and accept God's will for us. We don't weigh it like, hmm, this could be good for me. Or that's not really what I had planned in my life. He says that she was not weighing the cost and benefits, that she was weighing that her God was giving her a gift. And he says that if we think our faith is about going to church every Sunday, joining the choir, maybe going to committee, your Christianity is limited. Your Christianity is young. It's not something that's tit for tat. It's not an organization that is just meant to make our lives better. It's about belonging to Jesus. It's about that commitment we have to God and surrendering our lives to God. He says that there's two questions we have to ask ourselves. One, are we willing to obey what's in the Bible and what it says clearly, whether we like it or not? Number two, are we willing to trust God in any situation he sends us in our lives? Are we willing to give that ultimate acceptance that Mary did? And he says if we can't answer those two questions, then we have to realize there's some thinking we have to do. If we can't accept those two things, that's where we have to start digging deep. I really like this book. I'm, that's why I'm doing so much looking at it. I hope you buy it. It is so much food for thought about how we can take the story of Christmas and go deeper in our own lives. Everyone, we are going to break this podcast into a third step just because the material is very dense. Next week, we're going to talk a little bit about Jesus the King. So my challenge to you is think about your reactions to the things that God presents before you. Do you laugh? Are you skeptical? Are you like me and super practical and you want to know how you're going to make that work? Then think about Mary and what she did to something that was so impractical in human terms and how she reacted. What can you do to resolve those two visions? All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate listening. Please remember that you can subscribe to the podcast, smallstepswithgod.com. You can find all the different places and services this podcast on. You can also find my Twitter account and my email. And remember, we can walk in the way that Mary walked by taking small steps. Small steps.